So, so let me say a little bit about, about the cultural frameworks in, in both books, the Democratic Surround and From Counterculture to Cyberculture. We often tell ourselves a story that media technologies arrive and change things just by arriving, and especially in Silicon Valley, that's a very common story. But when you actually get up close and look at the technologies, what you find are different communities, communities of artists, thinkers, political people, activists, who discover these new technologies, start interacting with them, and then begin to reimagine their own existing projects in terms of the new technologies. And you can see this most clearly, I think, with, with um, oh, let's see, I suppose with the counterculture. You know, when, when the counterculture comes along in the 1960s, they're carrying forward a series of ideas about the way the world is organized that they have learned from the military research world of the 1940s. And in these ideas, cybernetics, computing, depicts a world without hierarchy, without politics, a world in which all we need to do is signal one another, and the machines will communicate with each other, and we can communicate with each other as if we too were machines. And so there's a kind of social vision that comes to the 1960s from the tech world, but it's a social vision in which we no longer need politics, all we need to do is share our minds, all we need to do is communicate. In the framework that I'm using there, the technology isn't really a tool for communication yet, it will be. Rather, it's a model, it's something I actually call a social prototype. It's a prototype of a way we can organize society. And communities like the counterculture take that up and use it to promote a way of living that they otherwise want to see in the world. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is a really challenging question. So I think a lot of Americans, especially right after World War II, thought that technology was kind of a uniquely American product and that we would export technology and consumer culture to the world. The world would absorb it and would change their political systems. Certainly that was true in America's view of China in the 1960s and 1970s. You know, finally when Nixon went to China after that, we thought, well, you know, if we just help China open up markets, China will become a democracy. Because doesn't everyone want to be a democracy? And, and, and this is a kind of deeply nationalistic fantasy that still clings, I think, to technologies. Um, but the fact on the ground is quite different. The facts on the ground are much more international. Silicon Valley, more than 50% of the people who live in Silicon Valley today were born in a country other than the United States. More than half of the people who live in Silicon Valley today speak a language other than English at home. Silicon Valley is a fully international place. And since the 1970s, with the rise of air travel, the rise of new media technologies, first television and cable, and now the internet, we live in a world where our access, Americans' access, to international ideas is greatly enhanced. So in my family in the 1970s, we had a, a visiting Chinese graduate student. And I'd never met a Chinese person, like a real Chinese person. And in the, this is the 1970s. It was like, oh my gosh. We just, my sisters and I just asked her questions all day long. She was so tired of it. She's very nice. Today, not even a question. The integration of the social worlds is much more serious and much more diverse. So that creates all kinds of new opportunities. We can see and borrow cultural designs from other places. And of course, we can offer cultural designs from the states to other places too. You know, I, I, I think that's, that's one of the greatest things about this time. I think it's also something that makes people very nervous. Um, when I say to my students that we live in an age of cultural appropriation, they get really angry with me. And they say, well, Fred, cultural appropriation is bad. We should need to allow each group to have their own authentic culture. And I say, life doesn't work like that. You know, Indian music can come to the States. You know, um, Shenzhen manufacturing can come to the States. And by the same token, the highly personalized, highly individualized style of manufacturing that we have in Silicon Valley can and does travel to, to other countries. Um, having said all of that, that was all about the power of culture. In that sense, I'm, 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 I'm an anti-Marxist. I think that you know, Marx always said that there was a base and a superstructure. I think today in the internet era, culture and cultural superstructure is a new kind of base. That said, technologies do have impacts. And, and one of the things that we can see, I think, happening around the world is a process that we can call mass individualization. 
And it's a really powerful process. In the 1940s and 50s, we were worried that cinema would make all Americans and Europeans just think the same thing. We were very worried about mass society. Today, we have something very different going on. We have a kind of global push toward individuation. We have cell phones in our pockets. We have instant internet contact. I can say something online, and it can be in China in 30 seconds. That's incredible. It used to be to have broadcasting power, you had to have a television station. Today, all you have to have is an iPhone. That's an amazing difference. Likewise, of course, our media feeds are very different. I bet we both have TikTok or something like that, and I bet your TikTok and my TikTok are very different. Um, and that's fascinating, right? So we have these highly individualized media systems. That, in turn, couples up with two other phenomena, I think. One is consumer goods, and the other is transportation. We live in a world where consumer goods are becoming ever more differentiated and ever more globally manufactured and circulated. It's very hard now to tell whether something was made in China, the United States, Bangladesh. Um, and, the, and you can see it in fashion, the kind of constant seeking for new, 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 new divisions. That enhances this process of individuation. Along with that, we have transportation. We have airplanes. I cannot tell you how different the travel world is now than when I grew up. When I grew up, to go on an airplane was like, oh, my family went on an airplane when I was about 10. We were dressed in suits. My, my sisters wore beautiful dresses. My mother and father dressed in a suit and a dress. We were very formal. We were very careful in how we presented ourselves. My mother combed my hair when we got out of the car at the airport because travel was so rare, so luxurious, so special. Now, it's like we all ride buses from continent to continent. That, in turn, increases both the frequency of cultural exchange and the value of cultural difference. So I think we live in a time when cultural difference, mass individuation, and the technologies that support that are driving social and economic change in many societies. And each society is dealing with it a little bit differently depending on their history. But the forces, I think, are quite similar across societies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't mean that societies are becoming ever more the same. No. I think that pressures are very similar, but societies react to them in very different ways. You know, I, 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 think, I think that, you know, you could argue that consumer culture is becoming globalized and quite similar. You know, I've been to Shanghai, and even Shanghai 20 years ago, people were dressing with styles borrowed from Europe. And, you know, I'm sure that, you know, I, I know that we're looking at Chinese auto manufacturers and that sometime quite soon I'm quite likely to be driving an electric Chinese car. Okay, great. So consumer culture might be leveling in that way. But just because you're wearing a French shirt or here in the States maybe listening to African music does not mean that you've changed your culture. You know, I, I think we can see strenuous efforts in different nations to preserve traditional cultures and to try to manage the changes that are underway in ways that keep the culture somewhat similar. I'm always amazed, you know, I, I work in Europe a lot, and, I, and I'm always amazed when I'm there how different the cultures are in countries that have been next to each other for 2,000 years. Like, how do they do that, right? And, um, or even with it, what little I know about China, within China, the South and the North are very different. <laughs> Oh, good, okay. Yeah. So, um, like, uh, Stuart Graham, um, like you said, China is a very important player in the world. Yeah. And uh, people have actually had quite a big um, arguments on it. Mm -hmm. Like, some people think he is a visionary, he anticipated trends. Mm -hmm. uh, and other people may think that they um, recognize him as an extremely important person in like, presenting. Sure. Yep. Okay. So let's begin by thinking about who Stuart Brand has been. So Stuart Brand um, was born not long after World War II, um, went to college at Stanford in the early 1960s, at a time when he thought the Cold War nuclear holocaust was about to happen at any moment. And like other members of his generation, he wanted to grow up to become an adult who did not have a kind of hierarchical, industrial, military way of living of the kind that seemed to have produced the nuclear holocaust. 
but he also wanted to grow up in a way where he didn't have to get rid of the technologies that had given him so much pleasure. Television, um, radios, stereos, um, very soon after that, LSD. Um, and, you know, he became a central member of the counterculture. Um, he joined um, Ken Kesey's Merry Pranksters, most famously. But what he was best known for was creating this, the Whole Earth Catalog. So, you know, this might look a little bit funky now, and I'm happy to give you a close-up view at any point. But, so th this was published first in 1968, and it came about when Stuart Brand and his wife Lois went to a series of communes to see what kinds of tools people needed. And this is the quintessential Stuart Brand move. Stuart Brand is what, what a sociologist would call a network entrepreneur. He finds the place between different social networks, creates an event or a publication that brings the networks together, and then once they come together, the network starts speaking the same language. And once they do that, he can speak it too. And so suddenly he hears the visions around him and can be credited as a visionary. I would argue that he's a little bit like P.T. Barnum was to the circus. He's not a circus performer, but without him, there's no circus. That would be my take. Um, you know, and so the whole of catalog is interesting. Um, 1966 to 1973, more or less, is the largest wave of commune building in American history. Almost a million Americans leave their homes and move to communes. They, they start living with other people to whom they're not related. They move out to the countryside. Brand sees this moment going on and says, I'm gonna give them tools. But what he does is he creates a list of tools and then shows you how to get them. You can't actually buy anything through this catalog. All you can do is see things that you might need and figure out how to get them for yourself. Steve Jobs would later argue that this was a forerunner of Google, right? And it, it makes a certain amount of sense. Um, Amazon's first programmer um, was part of the Whole Earth Catalog team. So it feeds directly into the tech world. But what's interesting to me is what he thought a tool was, right? If you were going back to the land and working on a farm, what kind of tools would you want? Like a tractor, far, a jeep, a, a hoe, a backhoe, something to dig with, a shovel? Me too. That's not what's in here. What's in here, there's some of that, but 80% of what's in the Holder's catalog is actually books. So here's page 322 from the last Holder's catalog, and look what they've got for tools. This is a giant calculator. Why do you need a giant calculator, right? Why do you need that? Or why do you need a book, um, I think, where is it? It's called Cybernetic Serendipity. Here it is, or here's what, data study. Why do you need to do data study on a commune farm, right? I mean, this is the same time when Mao is sending people to the farms they're not using computers like this. Why? And the answer turns out to be that for Stuart Brand and his community, they were trying to live out a dream that actually came from the middle of the military industrial world. And the dream was one where we could do away with politics, do away with hierarchy, and instead become literally like computers. We could share information, we could share data, we could see that the world was interconnected through invisible systems, and we could call that whole business consciousness. And from that consciousness, we could build a new kind of society in our set-aside places. All right. That idea is, 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 a, is a fusion of tech world things and countercultural things. And Brand is important because he hosts that conversation. You know, I, I like to say a lot like, you know, that I, I like to say that we got the heroes of the American Revolution wrong. We always talk about George Washington. The person we should be talking about is Martha Washington, his wife, because she has the dinners at the house where all the revolutionaries come together and make their plans. Stuart Brand is the Martha Washington of the tech world, of the counterculture. He brings these folks together and ha has the dinners, and this is one of them. So I don't think it's quite the right question to ask whether Brand is a visionary, a problem, Brand is a gatherer, a Barnum, a spokesman for a circus that is happening all around him. He is a genius at finding the right acts for the circus, the important acts for the circus. He's a genius at spotting the leading edge of debates. Um, and he's also, he's a fascinating guy. You know, when I met him, um, he was very, very open with me. He let me read his diaries, um, which is an incredible thing. They're very intimate diaries. Um, he gave me access to, to everything. And he's somebody who I think deeply believes in openness in a way that is both countercultural and cybernetic. And you can, you can 
hear echoes of that openness in the way that people live and work in Silicon Valley today. I very much admire that. Now, I disagree with Stuart Brand on many, many political issues. But setting that aside, I very much admire his openness and his ability to gather different communities together to move something forward. This question is about gender physics and technological innovation. Yep. And the question is, do things have to emerge from a gender perspective? Asserting that platforms like a Hayward Catalog will, were dominant by some uh, white males, yep. white straight males, distorting conversation, cultural norms, and hierarchic power dynamics. How do you perceive Great. So, so I very much agree with feminist critics who argue that in its origins, the tech world was a masculinist place and masculinist modes of interaction were built into the system. Um, it's also very clear that misogyny is an organizing force among different internet communities today. But what I want to do is distinguish the communities from the machines. If you go back to the counterculture, especially to the part of it that Stuart Brand is a part of, it is a deeply masculine world, a very male world, a very straight world. One reason I studied the counterculture was that I had just finished a book about the Vietnam War, and the story about the Vietnam War was so sad and heartbreaking. I'm like, I have to work on something happy. I know, I'll work on hippies and communes and they'll be happy. And so then I go and I do that work and I start talking to people who lived on communes and they're very unhappy. It turns out that communes are places where um, rules get pushed aside and instead of rules, what you get is what I call rule by cool. You get dominant charismatic men running the place, women being pushed down. Um, and you know, Stuart Brand's wife Lois said to me, she said, look Fred, when we would go to communes, Stuart would go to the big room and they would make important decisions in the men. Me and the other women, we go to the back room and put bleach in the water so people didn't get sick. It was a very segregated sort of world. The other thing about the communes was that they were very white. And it wasn't, there, was, there wasn't official racism, but there was a lot of that kind of unofficial exclusion. Like, I mean, you know, people just wanted to be with people like themselves. And that meant generally white folks with college educations or the ability to get them. And you know, most of the communes I looked at had no people of color at all. So given that kind of communal origin, it maybe isn't so surprising that as that generation moves into the tech world in California, it carries with it um, some of the sort of unspoken presumptions of that world. Something I see a lot in the tech world is something I saw in the communes. In the communes, when you take away regulation, when you take away bureaucracy, when you take away institutions, and you just say, ah, it's me and my friends, what you get are the worst norms of American culture. You get the suburbs on steroids. You get men dominating women. It's very straight. It's very white. It's very um, macho. In the tech world, when people call for systems like Facebook or Instagram that are about sharing with my friends. They are also calling for this kind of anti-institutional, anti-bureaucratic, and I would argue anti-democratic logic. They're, they're calling for a world of charisma, a world of people like themselves, a world where discrimination doesn't even have to be done officially because it's so present constantly unofficially. I think that drive has, has, has helped give rise to the new right in America. And it's a real problem. I think, I think it depends what the degree to which the tech world is still highly misogynist and racist depends what part of the tech world that you're in. You know, I mean, it, and it gets very complicated. I spent a lot of time at, at Facebook when it was still Facebook. And I, I was there one morning when I watched all the workers come into the headquarters building. And I just sat at the door and watched them. Very diverse ethnically, very diverse. Not at all mostly white folks, but also very international and not necessarily very diverse professionally. So it, it gets complicated. Um, I did a book with a photographer named Mary Beth Meehan called Seeing Silicon Valley, where we tried to surface what the working class in Silicon Valley looked like. And you know, here's a, here's a, a woman who runs a taqueria there. 
you know, I'm very proud of the book. It was interesting to me that when we tried to publish the book in the United States, no American publisher would touch it. They said, that's not Silicon Valley. Where are the tech bros? Where's Mark Zuckerberg? Where's Elon Musk? And that's our point exactly. As Americans, we've learned only to look at the, the, the elite white men who, who, who drive this, parts of this industry. We've learned to forget all of the people of color who just work here and whose lives are, are very different. So this is a Native American woman. She's a really important coder, not widely recognized. Um, you may know that we have a huge homeless problem here in Silicon Valley. Stanford University, where I work, is surrounded by trailers and people living inside their trailers like this because the housing is too expensive. So I guess the question I'm, I'm trying to raise is, have the dynamics of the counterculture become the dynamics of elite entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley? And if they are, what are they keeping us from seeing? And I think what they're keeping us from seeing is how they are producing inequality. In the same way that in the 1960s, communes produced worlds that were much more straight white male than we ever think, Silicon Valley is producing a world that is much more unequal than its leaders claim that it is. And we need to be alert to that. Yeah. So to answer your question about resistance in Silicon Valley today, we have to go back to the 1960s for a moment. I always thought there was one counterculture in the 1960s. I thought it was marching against the Vietnam War during the day and then taking LSD at night, getting up, doing it again. So cultural and political protest, I thought, were the same. It turns out not to be true. Two very different ways of doing protest. One in Berkeley, the new left, really seeking to do politics, form parties, to change a political system. The other, the new communalists, based in San Francisco and then on the communes, they, they didn't want to do politics at all. They thought they should just get technology, get their LSD, get their, their music, and get their heads together, have a new consciousness, and that would be the future. It's the, the fantasy in Silicon Valley is that we will make change by getting ever better communication technologies. That's a fantasy that serves the people who run tech companies very well. If you're going to resist tech here in the Valley, you don't resist tech as a user. You have to resist tech in a union. You have to resist tech in an institution. You have to take the new left road. And the new left road is very much a sort of Berkeley road. We're starting to see that now. We see tech workers now forming unions. Even, even executives are forming unions now, which is very new for us. Um, that's where I think we have to go. People in the tech industry have to realize that they are industrial workers, not just magical inheritors of an incredible device and the counterculture that fuels it. Oh, what a great question. If I could name Silicon Valley, what would I name it now? Oh, oh my. Oh, that is really, that's, I've never had that question, and that is a tough one. Well, let's think about what might go into the answer. So we call it Silicon Valley after the chips. We tend to forget that this region is one of the most polluted geographies in America. Um, we have Superfund sites all through the valley. Superfund sites are the most polluted sites in America. They've been abandoned by companies. The, st the state has to pay for them now. We have the highest concentration of those in one county here of any county in America. We have, I think last time we checked, we had 17 billionaires just in Silicon Valley. So we might call it the beautiful valley of radical inequality and ubiquitous pollution. It's a lot of words. You know, before it was Silicon Valley, it was called the Valley of Heart's Delight. That's what it was called. It was called the Valley of Heart's Delight, and it was a farming area. Where my house is was farmland until they built my house in 1954. Yeah, and Valley of Heart's Delight. Now, I don't know. I mean, the Valley of Inequality Production? I don't, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. 
So one of the illusions of Silicon Valley is that all that you need to do to think about the Valley is think about its technologies and its culture. But there's a third piece that we have to reintegrate and it's very central to the Valley today and that's business. This is a highly profitable for-profit region that is deliberately and explicitly taking up its mythology, taking up its history to mask a, a, a tremendous effort at making a huge amount of money. So on the one hand, locally in Silicon Valley, we have a culture where we talk to each other, um, the boundaries of companies are very open, you can talk to anybody who works anywhere, um, you know, I'll go out for beers and I'll be sitting in the bar and I'll be hearing these amazing conversations from Google, I'm like, you shouldn't be talking about that here. So very open, but at the same time very profit driven. And the profit driven part comes in as the companies face outward. You know, you think about a Facebook or, or even a, a different AI companies, they are essentially mining enterprises. As we used to mine coal, as we used to mine um, uh, fossil fuels, now we take the social world and we mine our interactions and we resell them as products online and we attach advertising to them. We, we tell ourselves here in the Valley that we're changing the world by making it possible for people to communicate with one another. That's a resuscitation of the old countercultural dream of a world without politics, a world of just shared mind. But it's bullshit. It's just, it's, it's, it's propaganda. It's a way of selling a new marketing strategy that you know, Shoshana Zuboff has famously called surveillance capitalism. That's where we live now. And at least in Silicon Valley, that's the culture that we're exporting now. The last thing to say is that in the stories about places like Facebook or Google, they will tell you all users are equal. Look, we make a technology for everyone. Maybe they do, but they make a technology whose wealth disenfranchises most people. Most people are sources of mining data. A few people profit from that. It's a lot like the early 20th century when coal miners chopped up mountains and people worked in the mines and they got sick and the owners lived somewhere else completely. It's, it's a mixed bag because on the one hand, nothing changes in the sense that we, we really are, I think, in, a, in another predatory industrial period. But I do think some things change and it's hard to remember those at the same time. I think that the mass individuation we talked about earlier is an incredible phenomenon. I think that, that a media scape that allows us to see so many different ways of being in the world is an incredible thing. You know, I grew up in a very small town in the countryside. Men who were um, effeminate there, when they were boys, would be beaten up. I watched my daughter go to her graduation from eighth grade, she was 13, and one of her friends stood on the stage and talked about what it was like to be a 13-year-old gay woman. That's an incredible change in one generation. And it's because of media, because of the internet, because of the ways that it shows us the world. So on the one hand, yes, the effects are, are, are often quite negative, but not exclusively negative. And this is one of our challenges. Very happy to talk about that. Oh, lots of ideas about that, yeah. So the visual culture of Silicon Valley has changed a lot. In the 1960s, both machines and culture were different. The machines tended to be very large, room-sized, um, kind of clunky. People were only just beginning to be able to do visual drawing kinds of things. It was still very number-heavy and point-heavy. Um, by contrast, the art scene here, such as it was, um, was very... Um, hand-drawn, hippified. So the early Apple materials, if you can go back and look at early Apple's, Apple's very earliest pamphlets, they were all hand-drawn. Um, they felt like a drawing that your friend had given you. And so the aesthetic was one of, look, these super high-powered machines really belong in our very low-key, back-to-the-land, handwritten world. Okay, that's changed a lot. Starting in the 1980s, um, the Burning Man Festival came along. And I think Burning Man is a very good representative of the new aesthetic. Burning Man is a festival where last time 70,000 people went. And um, they build a city out in the desert. And you live in different camps, different communities. And you make art. You make these large technologically centered art forms. And 
in Silicon Valley, the art is pretty high tech and pretty hard to do. It's very difficult to work out in that desert. It's very hot. The desert sand itself is sort of toxic. It's miserable. But people do it. And I asked them why. I spent a lot of time there. And they say, well, you know, here I can basically live out the val values of Silicon Valley, the things they tell me I can get at work. But I can do it with my friends, and it's my own. I own it. So you have these project teams working in the valley, making high-tech art. And then that art will sometimes be sent back to San Francisco, be part of the city. That's where we are now, right? And so the hand-making has really changed. No, they're part of techno-utopianism. And blockchain in particular is part of a fantasy that we can trace back to the 1940s. And the fantasy is, again, this fantasy of a world without government, a world in which technologies and good-hearted people working with technologies can replace the self-evidently power-hungry worlds of politics. Um, I don't think it's effective. Um, blockchain has not shown um, the ability to replace other institutions. On the contrary, you see the kinds of abuses in blockchain because it's deinstitutionalized, because it's not regulated, that you used to see in the stock, stock market. So remember, I teach at Stanford, which produced Sam Bankman-Fried. I don't know if you're familiar with Sam. Sam ran a multi-billion dollar scam um, in Bitcoin, and he ran that in Bitcoin in part because the industry was massively deregulated. And so, so no. It may be that Bitcoin is a new kind of money. Great. But will Bitcoin produce a, a, a happier society for more folks? I doubt it very much. Yeah, it's a really great question, and it's 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 you know it's a much bigger question than I can probably give a real answer to. But I'll try because, you know, why not? Um, for some years now, for some decades, the fantasy ha in the Silicon Valley has been that if we build tech, what we used to call technologies of consciousness, technologies of communication, and we build them large enough and we spread them throughout the world, a new, more democratic world will emerge. We're seeing that that's not true. Elon Musk at the moment controls almost all of the satellites that are required for Starlink, which is the American government's technology for providing help to the Ukrainians. We are dependent on a single private enterprise for what is essentially a national project. And you see that kind of privatization move happening in lots of different places. Um, so my sense is that what we need to do is actually find ways to build institutions that can use tech, constrain tech, and improve our lives. I don't think that um, technologically enhanced communication necessarily frees us. Um, it individuates us, but that's not the same thing as being free. I think being free depends on having institutions that ensure the more equal distribution of resources, that ensure that when there's a collective need, that need is represented in some way, and it's not just in the hands of one leader, you see this privatization impulse in tech, but many other places. In America, private ent entities are trying to take over the school system. They're trying to take over health care. They've taken over health care. How do we have a representative of the collective good? And how do we have institutions that do that fairly and well? That's, I think, the question. And I think that one of the things you see around the world right now is different political systems competing to provide that. And I think every system has some things that are strong. Many of them, including our own, tend toward authoritarian oligarchy. That's a problem. Um, I don't know where we're headed, but I think the answer is in politics, not in technology, and especially not in using technology in lieu of politics.